Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be back. I was here yesterday for the rehearsal. And uh, I'll tell you what we were rehearsing. We're rehearsing this new show. Uh, oh, my name is George Goble. Uh, I just thought I'd tell you that there. We're having this new show, and it's... See, it's George L. Goble, really, but the L doesn't mean anything. It's just so that I can have GLG embroidered on my shirts. <laughs> That's pretty slick right there because that keeps my stuff from getting mixed up at the laundry with Greta Garbo's. <laughs> now, my father's name was George Goble also, and it's a funny thing, but he never got his stuff mixed up at the laundry with Greta Garbo's. I mean, some people just... Although I will say this now, that he did look a little silly one time in a pair of Greer Garson's culottes. <laughs> but, uh, that's beside the point. Now, my grandfather's name was George Goble, too, which is largely due to the fact that his father's name was George Goble. And his father's father's name was George Goble. And his father's 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 name was George Goble. And his father's 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 name was Prince Valiant. <laughs> so, so there you are. And here I am, and here's the show. Dial Shampoo, the new shampoo that gives your hair a diamond spark. And mild, fragrant Dial Soap that stops perspiration odor before it starts. And now, Dial brings you from Hollywood, George Goebel. In the George Goebel Show. Starring George Goebel. With his guest, Mr. Fred McMurray. Miss Peggy King. John Scott Trotter and his orchestra. Here, of all people, is the great, 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 great grandson of Prince Valiant. Now you can see that I wasn't lying to you. See, that's the, that's the kind of fellow I am. Honest, straightforward, trustworthy, dull. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you the kind of fellow I am. If you want to know the kind of fellow I am, I'll tell you just the kind of fellow I am. See, I'm the kind of fella. See, like, like if I hear somebody on the radio say, run down to your neighborhood store, well, I run. <laughs> you know, uh, well, you can laugh, but a lot of people walk. I run, because in the first place, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, and them fellas on the radio, they know whether you walk or run down to your neighborhood store. Mm -hmm. Because them storekeepers, they all belong to Tom Mix's straight shooters, and they report all that stuff right away. And that's the kind of show this is going to be. Nobody's going to be running around here on a dead run and telling you a lot of big lies, uh, like me. See, if, if I tell you a lie, I'll tell you that it's a lie. Unless I'm lying, of course. <laughs> Which I won't. I mean, I don't anymore, hardly. <laughs> now, this show, I want to tell you what it's about and what it's like. It's kind of hard to, to see. It's a sort of a, well, you might call it a comedy show, is what you might. Now, you might call it a lot of things before we're through, but uh, <laughs> that's what we're going to call it, a comedy show. We figure it's our show. We'll call it whatever we feel like calling it. <laughs> But, I mean, don't get the idea that this is the greatest show in the world, or, I mean, it's not hilarious, uh, maybe jocular, or uh, hum... Well, it might just keep you from getting sullen. <laughs> I'm going to have to tell you a few things that we're going to have on the show. Now, for one thing, we're going to have chorus girls. I think they're nice. <laughs> and, uh, of course, most variety television shows have chorus girls, but I think we have been very fortunate in that particular regard because uh, we have a, a wonderful... Well, I mean, they're right back here now. This is our chorus, and we'd like for you all to meet them. Curtain, please. <laughs> Uh, 
I would like to announce to you sports in the audience that some of these girls aren't married. <laughs> now then, what are you girls, what are you girls going to sing for us? <laughs> we don't sing. Well, I'll be a dirty bird. <laughs> uh, you dance then? No, uh, we don't dance. Well, do you play musical instruments or ride unicycles or do close order drill or anything like that? <laughs> We don't do anything. Oh. Well, see, that's what I was telling you just a few minutes ago. That's why we hired these girls for their honesty. <laughs> now, another thing that's very important in any musical show or any variety show is the music. And I think that uh, we... I don't like to brag on myself usually, but we do have one of the finest musical directors who ever shook a stick. I mean, now, uh, he's a Toscanini, a Castellanitz, a Stokowski and a Tweet Hogan all rolled into one. <laughs> and I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about, John Scott Trotter, Mr. John Scott. How are you, John? I thank you, sir. Sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sounds like, uh, sounds, like uh, sounds like we have a little of the Duca Paducah rolled in there, too. Oh, I thank you, George, for those comparisons you made in my introduction, but uh, you know I'm a little puzzled. Uh, who is Tweet Hogan? Well, I'll be a dirty bird. <laughs> Tweet Hogan is a very fine musician friend of mine from Chicago. He had a society band oh, back nice. there. Really Wonderful nice. band. It was, wasn't a big band. Nine pieces. Nine. All drums. <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't drums, really. They weren't drums. They were uh, tom-toms is what they were. You mean all nine men played tom-toms? Ever tom-tom, dick, dick, and Harry. <laughs> These boys, you got back here. This is a good, lively bunch, John. You know what? Thank you. Thank you. They really and and they keep good time too. You know what? I know. I timed them. <laughs> they keep very good. What's this? The music? This here? is the music, George. All new stuff. All new arrangements for oh, the show. Oh, that's good. You mind if I look at it? No, no. Go right ahead. You got some dandies here. I was looking at it. Here's one. We had an old cow who wouldn't give no milk, so we sold him. <laughs> So here's another one. The bullfight fans all shouted ole as the bull ripped Hernando's hideaway. <laughs> hey, how about this one right on top? Is What's that pretty tough? I mean... No, what's that? I'll see if the boys remember it. Uh, right. Number one, gentlemen. to some of you, but you can't blame the fellow. Now, after all, 17 years were the same show. 17 years, man and boy. Bing was a man and Gary was a boy. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, while Mr. John Scott Trotter is trying to pull himself together, I say there's a project right there. <laughs> we would like you to hear a word from our sponsors. And incidentally, that's another important thing if you're going to have a television show as sponsors. In fact, you can't hardly even turn a crank until you get one. <laughs> and I want to tell you, we have two of the nicest crank <laughs> sponsors the show ever had. Like the Dial Soap folks, for instance, they have a little music movie that they're going to show to you now. And as they hardly ever used to say in the Navy, now see this. How would you like to win an oil well and have money flowing in for years? That's the grand prize in Dial Soap's big contest. In addition, 206 cash prizes every week for six weeks. And to one of the six weekly winners, the full operating income from a producing oil well or $25,000 cash. To enter, write a two-line jingle starting, I'm glad I use Dial. Last word in both lines must rhyme. For example, I'm glad I use Dial. I wish everyone would. For Dial stops odor in a way that is good. Put each entry on a separate piece of paper, print name and address, send with dial wrapper to dial, box 7199, Chicago 77. That's dial, box 7199, Chicago 77. Entries received after midnight Saturdays judged in next week's contest. 
Get complete rules and entry blanks where you buy dial soap. Enter every week. You may win cash or an oil well and have money flowing in for years. Now, about that big oil well contest, I feel it's only fair to tell you that, uh, well, some of you people are going to lose. <laughs> now, the next thing that a variety television show requires is a very fine guest star, and we're delighted to have as our first guest that very handsome, one of the most popular and handsome leading men in pictures today, Mr. Fred McMurray. <laughs> Say, you know, that's right, this dude is handsome. <laughs> George, you're too kind. No, oh, I'm too short. <laughs> <laughs> well, George, this is your first show, and I just want to wish you all the luck in the world, because you're you. a real fine fella. Thank you. <laughs> and, George, just to kind of help you get things rolling along, I, uh, I brought this. Please, there'll be no smoking in the studio. <laughs> George, this is a saxophone. You uh, do expect me to play, don't you? Well, Mr. McMurray, we really don't. Just tell you call me Fred, huh? Yeah, well, Mr. Fred, to tell you the truth, that's one of my pet peeves as far as television is concerned. They invite a guest star over, and then they make him work. And if you invite somebody to your home as your guest, you don't make him work. No. Is that right? So I'll tell you what we want you to do. We want you to come over here and sit down and just make yourself at well, home. Well, now, wait a minute, George. You know, I, whenever I'm invited out, I'm usually asked to play the saxophone. And Yeah, well, that might be all right for some of them wild Hollywood parties. <laughs> well, how about the clarinet? Then? No, I don't believe so. Well, I'll tell you, uh, how about a card trick? I've no, got some... no, we can't, we don't have... I know what I can do. I can do a scene from Kane Mutiny. I just happen to have the boat outside. And... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you don't, you don't seem to understand you're our guest. Now, just sit down here and just help yourself to the cookie, will you? Just take it easy. Everything is going to be all right. George, do you mean that you're paying me to come on this show and all you want me to do is sit here and eat cookies? You're our guest. <laughs> Well, I'll be a dirty bird. Now, look, Fred, I'm going over and introduce the girl singer. And they're the best kind, you know? <laughs> now, our sponsor wanted for a girl singer a sweet, wholesome, typical American girl just like the girl that lives next door. And I was thinking pretty good at the time. I went home on a dead run, and I got the girl that lived next door to me, and here she is. <laughs> Now, you can see how that didn't work out too well. So I did the only thing that a good, clean-cut, red-blooded American boy would do. I moved. <laughs> a little moving music, please, John. And this is the house that I moved next door to. And you can see that's not the worst move I ever made. Hello. Good evening. I'm the typical American boy that lives next door. Next door? Uh-huh. That's a pet shop. Yeah, well, I'm a typical American eager beaver. <laughs> What's your name? Peggy King. Oh, would you like to sing on my television show? Oh, uh-huh. What would you like to sing? A song? <laughs> I don't know how that goes. <laughs> I know how it goes, George. I'm so, trying to tell you that you're supposed to be... Will you just... Uh, wait here, just one second, please. Sing, Peggy. No, no. Now, come on. Wait, Peggy, wait. wait. Look, George, I have a recitation I could do. It'd be very appropriate at this time, you know, with the World Series and all. Casey at the bat. Fred, it's real nice, but you're supposed to be our guest. Now, why don't you come down here and eat me a little Tear my pictures up and burn them. I don't want them, don't return them. If you do, they'll be the devil to pay. Burn them up, burn them up, and blow the ashes away. Told me we were through life. I went out and found a new life. Find my old love letters tied up in blue. Burn them up, burn them up, 
right away, whatever you do. I wrote them, I sent them, I thought that I meant them, but I was a fool, was a fool to write. My new love would burn up if those letters turn up, so please get a match, get a match and let them go. I've been smoked tonight. When you come to town, don't phone me. Make believe you've never known me. Gather up the records we used to play. Burn them up, burn them up, and blow the ashes away. Thank you, thank you. Really thank you. Thank I you. just have one little criticism. What's, I, uh, what's that? Well, I thought you might be able to use just one more saxophone. Hmm? Fred, look, you're supposed to be our guest. Primarily, <laughs> I know I'm your guest. I know Why this, George. I know, look, like it just isn't right, my getting all this money and doing... I am getting the money. <laughs> sure, you're getting the money, well, but all you right, don't... Then all I can say is that I feel very guilty taking the money and not no, doing anything to earn it. Give it another thought. Just sit here and behave yourself and, and concentrate on the cookies. I don't want to. See, I'll tell you what, George. you better concentrate because if you get one with a pink center, you win a left turn on Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> George, tell me, how did you get into this business? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, Fred. You see, up until about seven or eight years ago, I was in the Army, and then right after I was sprung, <laughs> separated, I should say, uh, well, I'd used up my muster and out check, and uh, my final pay, and my savings, and my wife's savings, and my three-and-a-half-month-old boy's savings, and I cashed in my war bonds, and I took all the beer bottles back, <laughs> root beer, that is, and it got to a... well, things got pretty grim. So this one morning, I was in my apartment... <laughs> Uh, this is my apartment, but it's not really my apartment. See, like I say, uh, we're not going to tell you any lies here. This is a facsimile. Oh. <clears throat> and it's not even what you call a reasonable facsimile because the kind of apartment we had them days, well, you just can't hardly get them no more. <laughs> so anyway, here's me. I'm in bed this one morning. That's one thing I learned in the Army. Sleep, boy. <laughs> It's 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, Alice, now that I've seen what it looks like one time, don't ever wake me at this unearthly hour again. <laughs> George! You've got to be the breadwinner. Don't you understand? In civilian life, the husband has to be the breadwinner. Alice, believe me, I was down at that bakery shop all day yesterday and my number didn't come up one <laughs> You know, I believe, I believe that Schultz is running a crooked game. <laughs> George, you've been out of the army five months now. You and your footlocker. And not one penny has come into this house. Well, Alice, I told you not to quit your job. Now, let's don't make a big deal. <laughs> George. George, it's time you realize you have a wife and baby to support. You've got to work. Work? Yeah. <laughs> Alice, didn't I fight a war for you? <laughs> so did Eisenhower. But you don't see his family starving. He didn't take to loafing just because the war was over. He, he went out and got himself a job as president. Yeah, and you know how he got that job, too, don't you? Politics, that's how. <laughs> Alice, if you'll excuse me, this is the time of day I usually wind my watch. And this is the time now, listen, George. If you don't go out today and find a job... You, you, you'll blame me for the consequences. Oh. Um. George, you've got to think of somebody besides yourself. You've got to think of me. Alice. Didn't I fight a war for you? <laughs> <laughs> so did Eisenhower. Well, you can see how a guy can't stand that kind of nagging too long. <laughs> uh, a little bit after that, I got out of bed. Or I say a little bit after that. It wasn't really a little bit. I say a little bit, you know, but it wasn't a little bit. I say a little bit, but it wasn't really a little bit. It was, uh... 
It was the following spring that I got it. <laughs> That's the way it was. And anyway, we uh, have another cookie, Fred. Look, George, I hate to be stubborn about this thing, but I still feel I ought to be doing something. Well, Fred, you're a guest. I you know, but you're that... wasting me, George. I, I'm fairly versatile. I sing a little. I, Well, like in that last sketch you did just there. I could have played something in that. Look, it was just Judith Ames playing Alice and me playing me. Now, Fred, what could you have played? The saxophone. <laughs> but, Fred, I saw the Kane mutiny and I thought you were great. Now, you Thank started you. that mutiny. Now, let's don't start another one here. <laughs> and see, it's not that I have anything at all against the way you start mutinies, because I'll say this, you are a pretty good old mutiny starter when you get started starting one. But the idea is we just don't have the facilities here for a court martial. <laughs> okay, George. That's your attitude. I won't interrupt you. Go ahead with your story. Well, I'm not going ahead with a story. No. We'll go ahead with a movie. It's called Dial S for Soap. <laughs> the soap that gets you extra clean is Dial, Dial, Dial. The soap with hexachlorophene is dial, dial, dial. Even when perspiring, you won't worry about odor if you use dial soap every day. Let me show you why. Normal perspiration has no odor until it comes up against skin bacteria. They cause the odor. But ordinary good soaps can't remove bacteria effectively. Thousands are left on the skin, sort of like this. But washing with Dial takes away up to 95% of these troublemakers. Dial's hexachlorophene does it. There's nothing else as good at removing bacteria. And it clings to your skin, keeping you fresh all day. That's how Dial stops odor before it starts. And Dial smells good. Aren't you glad you use Dial soap? Don't you wish everybody did? All right, now, folks, I just want you to take a car, just any car at all. Fred, Fred, you promised you're not going to interrupt. Now, come on, oh, let's I'm go. sorry. Have a cookie, will you? I don't want to. <laughs> what are you going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to go on with my story. That's what I'm going to do. So after that, you see, I finally coaxed myself down to an employment agency. this fellow had me do is sign my name on the back of the application under some very small, fine print. And I could see they'd been in business for quite a while. <laughs> now, see, I've always been a pretty shrewd kid, so I said, uh, what was that I just signed? <laughs> well, Mr. Goble's really nothing. Merely a contract guarantee under the terms of which you remit a nominal portion of your earnings to the agency on a fee-service basis. Yeah, well, how small is a nominal portion I'm supposed to remit to this here agency? Your first three months' salary. Well, now, isn't that a little bit steep? Well, it's for your benefit, Mr. Goble. After all, if we're going to take three months of your salary, we're going to get you the highest-paid job we can. Now, aren't we? Sure you are. <laughs> now, the first thing we should do is try to find what position is best suited to your aptitudes. Well, shall we look? Now, let's see what we have here. Oh, yes. Uh, nuclear physicist? Uh, thermodynamic technician? Investment analyst? No. Oh, here's a good one. Antibiotic research chemist. Ditch digger. <laughs> Sheep herder. <laughs> no, must have owned crook. <laughs> Taffy, Taffy apple twister. Geiger counter counter. <laughs> A minute, Mr. Goble. Here is a great one. United plumbers have an opening. Are you by any chance a steam fitter? Well, now it all depends on what I have to fit this steam into here. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, Mr. Goble, I found it very difficult to place a man with your your particular all of your particulars. Well, I, I don't understand about all this particular business because I'm not too particular. I know what kind of job I want. 
I want a job that pays about $30 an hour, one day a week, time and a half for overtime, a partnership maybe, <laughs> here maybe. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Gold, that has all the earmarks of a dirty, un-American statement. Friend, you're not questioning my patriotism. I am. Friend. Didn't I fight a war for you? <laughs> so did Eisenhower. <laughs> well, see, I could have stayed in bed and heard that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you all know how I happen to get started in this business, or at least you know how I ha didn't happen to get started in any other particular business. You well, know. George. Huh? Well, George, you got any more cookies? No, but we do have just a little bit of time here, and I think if we hurry up, you'll have a chance now to play your saxophone. Oh, thanks, George, but uh, I don't want it now. Yeah, well, how about a couple card tricks? No, no. A scene from one of your pictures? No. I'll, I'll tell you, George, I've been sitting here thinking, and I've decided that you're right. A guest just should be a guest. Just, uh, well, I'm your guest, George, and your sponsor's guest, right? Yes, George Goble and Fred McMurray have been brought to you by the makers of Dial Shampoo. The new shampoo that gives your hair a diamond sparkle. And mild, fragrant dial soap that stops perspiration odor before it starts. Yes, sir, George, you've got the idea. I guess just ought to take his pay and take it easy. <laughs> well, I'll be a dirty bird. <laughs> uh, want me to come back next week? I'm not even sure I'm going to be back here next week. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, next week the George Goebel Show will be brought to you by Pet Evaporated Milk. And Instant Pet Non-Fat Dry Milk. Here's a miracle happening right before your eyes. These tiny snowflakes turn into delicious non-fat milk instantly. Yes, these magic snowflakes of new instant pet non-fat dry milk mix instantly as you add water and stir with a spoon. No shaking, no foaming. Make delicious fresh tasting non-fat milk instantly whether you make a glass or a quart. These magic snowflakes are a brand new scientific development rich in all the protein, minerals, and B vitamins of whole milk, yet so light they always mix instantly. It's delicious with wonderful fresh milk flavor, and it's instant. You can use it for drinking, for cooking, any way you'd use milk. Instant Pet cuts milk bills in half. One jar makes three quarts of delicious non-fat milk. Get this new Miracle Milk product in the glass jar at your grocer's. If he doesn't have it now, he will soon. Instant pet non-fat dry milk. And now, Fred, that we've heard from my sponsors, uh, would you like to say a word from yours? Oh, yes. Yes, I would, George. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred McMurray appeared on this program tonight through the courtesy of June Haper. Next week, our guest will be Angela Lansbury, and we hope we'll see you all again. And until then, this is your old friend, Lonesome George, hoping to be among the very first to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. In tonight's cast, Judith Ames was Alice, and Bob Jellison was that fussy little man. The George Goble Show is a Gomalco production.